Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Diana Wiley. I'm your host of Love, Lust, and Laughter. So happy because, once again, we have Sherry Winston with us. She is the author of Succulent Sex Craft. It's such an excellent book. And um, we're going to talk today about, well, in the East, it's evening. Here in Seattle, it's in the afternoon. Doesn't matter. You're going to hear us. (laughs) We're going to talk about relationship skills or relation skills. Play nicely with others is how Sherry puts it. Don't you, Sherry? Hello. (laughs) Hello, Diana. Yeah, that's that's how I like to say, right? I mean, weren't we just been trying to learn that since we were little, how to play nicely with others? (laughs) How to play nicely with others and... uh, And we're going to talk about that today um, with um, the connection uh, uh, tools and skills and uh, awareness and communication skills and boundary skills. And I think a number of our listeners have heard you before because you're a frequent guest. I love having you on the show, Sherry. You're so knowledgeable, and, and I've recommended your book to countless people, not only on this show, but with my clients and with great results. Um, Succulent Sex Craft is not your only book, but it is the one that sells the most, or can you talk about that a little bit before we get into the topic for the day? Actually, Women's Anatomy of Arousal is by far the bestseller. Um, Oh, okay. About all of the parts that women really have, including the ones that even medical professionals and sex teachers and so forth don't know about. So that's actually sort of my my bread and butter book. Uh, Succulent Sex Craft is really about how to have extraordinary sex, how to become a an yeah. erotic virtuoso. Yes. Um, so those are my two books. Yeah. So so P, so women buy your sexual anatomy book. And because they really want to know more, I'm saying the obvious, but they want to know more about how their bodies work and respond. And you and I, the last time you were on the show a couple of weeks ago, talked about the vestibular bulbs, something that a lot of people don't know about under the labia connected to the clitoral system. But what's the, what kind of feedback have you gotten from your readers who uh, for, the, well, for your first sexual I would anatomy say book? That, uh, it's yeah, it's for men and women. So, um, yeah, at least for for men who partner with women, I should say. Good. Yeah. Um, yes. So it's really for anyone who owns the equipment or would like to help bring a great pleasure to people who own the equipment. Yeah. And uh, it's um, uh, I get people basically saying it's been life changing, and um, mm-hmm. I get letters from people that bring tears to my eyes where this oh sherry wow yeah no it's really it's it's life-changing i can say for myself when i figured out the actual anatomy what parts i really owned including all the ones that were left out of my textbooks you know i spent Mm -hmm. a lot of years getting a lot of initials after my name um so this is information that was not in the textbooks and the sex books. And for me, it radically expanded my pleasure and my sexual potential. Um, and, of course, I shared it with partners, and they were all very grateful because, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, everyone makes everybody happier. It's it's really important information to know, not just for pleasure but for health also. So there's really yes. multiple reasons why you would want to know what equipment you have, how it operates, how to make it happy, um, for um, all sorts of reasons, but did we did we, have we done a show on that? I can't even remember if we have or not. If not, we should totally do one. <laughs> Absolutely, um, off the air we'll schedule. Yes, and I need to get that book. I haven't. I don't have it, but I I can um, get it on Amazon. Remedy right? that. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, not only can you get it on, get it on Amazon. Um, actually, yeah. I'd be happy to send you a copy. But also, um, there's an audio book that I recorded myself that oh, has um, so a downloadable PDF of my illustrations of the anatomy, which I think it's essential to see. Uh, it's also available on Kindle. And, mm-hmm. very exciting, 
We have got a Spanish translation uh, that we have been working on for quite some time that should be out within a month. So I'm thrilled about that. Yeah, you have a you would have a potential huge market in uh, Mexico and South America and. Right, and and I yeah. used to work with uh, Maria Flaherty, who who is uh, bilingual, and um, her her uh, maiden name is Yipaz, so she's of Mexican descent, and she would do a lot of shows in in Mexico in Spanish, and worked for the Latino uh, radio. I've forgotten what it's mm-hmm. called. But they were just, mm-hmm. this is going back some years, but they were just hungry for information, and especially with the Catholic, Catholic Church sort of reigning down there, um, information is hard to come by sometimes. And, of course, there's a large Spanish-speaking population even in the U.S., so... Sure. Um, as well as, you know, countries like Spain. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah. very exciting yeah. that, we've, that we've got that translation project. Almost, almost complete. So that's fun. But yeah, that, so that's, yes. a, that's, that's the book I usually actually tell people to start with because start I think with that it. understanding your equipment is foundational. And mm-hmm. uh, if you partner with somebody, like I said, with that equipment, um, you want to give them all the pleasure that's possible, Yeah, that's where to start. And that's, I think, where we met when I was teaching that yes. class. At uh, yes, uh, the conference, yeah, in in Monterey, Monterey, California, yeah, yeah, and um, that's mm. where we met, and that was about 2013 or 2012, right in there, don't you think? <laughs> you say so, <laughs> but but you had it was standing room only. <laughs> it was really standing room only. Yeah. People were very interested in this, and and our listeners should know that. Sherry is a really, she's an excellent artist, and, oh, I just happened, I have the book Succulent Sex Craft in front of me, I just happened to open to your drawing of the vestibular bulbs, and and it really helps with the understanding of it, and it's all tied in with the clitoral, but your drawings are really good. Uh, t- tell, us, tell us a little bit about your art, fine arts background. Oh, well, that's interesting. I mean, I actually, through most of my teenage years, just planned on becoming an artist and uh, mm. went to move to New York after high school and went to art school for a while and mm-hmm. dropped out of art school because I was broke. But also I realized I, I didn't want to be an artist as my livelihood. And, and then I sort of started down the path into um, um, being a massage therapist, childbirth educator, you know, midwife assistant, blah, blah, blah nursing midwife, childbirth education, you know, the whole birth world. Yeah. I went into But that. all of that but is I always, uh, foundational yeah, for I, what you do now, very much so. Oh, it's awesome. It's so yeah. awesome. But I never stopped making art just for my own pleasure. And so for me, um, and, I, and I'd taken anatomy illustration courses and things like that, again, just for my, you know, electives in college or for fun, because um, I love anatomy and I love art and I like illustrating things. So it was just one of the great joys of my life that I was then able to uh, illustrate my own book. So the fact that that kind of came back around. And, and when I teach, I, I use a lot of visuals because, I, again, I'm a, I've got that artist brain. So for me, visuals are really an effective way to communicate information. So it's just it's, uh, it's a delight to me that that... Um, artist's ability and sensibility has informed my teaching work and, and helped make it accessible to people. Anything that makes these ideas accessible is a, is a positive as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. No question about it. Um, I have to interject a little story about my paternal grandmother who was born in 1888 and she went to university and even graduate school which is very unusual for a woman of her time but she um, Mm -hmm. she studied sculpture and at that time women weren't allowed to study sculpture but Mm -hmm. she really was interested in anatomy and her her name is Laura Steer L-O-R-A-S-T-W-E-R-E my maiden name and um, 
So the way she, she made money when she was in graduate school was to do anatomical drawings for medical books. And I remember seeing some of those drawings, and they were very detailed and very interesting. And, of course, I called on Grandma Laura for some of my science projects, <laughs> like the anatomy of a chicken, I remember was one of them. <laughs> anyway. Um, wonderful to yes, have that. It, it is wonderful, and I'm looking to my left, and she did this sculpture of me when I was two holding a shell. I don't know that I went around holding shells very often, but it's very cute. (laughs) It's a bronze sculpture, you know, sort of life-size. But um, the visual part is so important. And you're a teacher. You're a sexuality teacher, and you you know people, I think, retain the information better if they can look at something. And Well, and also, uh, you know, people learn in different ways. And some people are visual learners, and the visual is important. Other people, it's auditory, or, you know, some people it's really the words and the thinking it through. Uh, Other people need to do something physical and kinesthetic to get the information in. So I think as a teacher, the more ways I can offer information to people, the more likely I'm going to hit on the thing that will work for them and get them to take it in. So that's always a goal of mine as a teacher to uh, try to teach to all those different sorts of intelligences. Very wise, and that, of course, makes, makes you an excellent teacher. Um, so you. you, in talking about connection tools and skills, you, you start out, it, you sent me an outline, which I always appreciate, awareness balance between self-awareness, partner awareness, and partner awareness you and partner awareness us. So the self-awareness I. And before you talk about that, I just wanted to to comment that um, sometimes the key to a better sex life might be in repairing your relationship with yourself. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. And that is the self-awareness I. That's part of it. And I think it's good Mm -hmm. to think about what would make you feel desirable. And, of course, desire is often the result of an emotional connection. Um, Although I do say to my clients, my low-desire women, you know, and, of course, this is not new information for those of us in the field, but so often arousal precedes desire, so you have to allow yourself to be aroused and be in a good emotional place, feeling safe, um, and then, the, arous- then the, the desire is more apt to kick in um, because there is pleasure in all those non-penile touches and nibbles and kisses and licks and deed sex can be very satisfying without intercourse or even without orgasm. But we, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but the self-awareness thing, <laughs> the I thing, and knowing yourself well and what turns you on. Can you elaborate on that or, and more? Because it's, yeah, yeah self-awareness, well, let me the I. Start with just mm-hmm. a, a larger framing. So um, I believe in order to have a fantastic sex with ourselves and with our partners and fantastic relationships, we need skills and that these are learnable skills. And I think just that concept alone that we learn how to have a good relationship with ourselves. We can learn how to have good relationships with partners, but we we don't come into this world knowing those things and we usually don't get them modeled in our culture. Mm-hmm. So starting out with that framework is there are all these things to learn. The, the next piece is I believe our relationship with ourselves is our foundational relationship. So if I want to have a good partner relationship, if I want to have great partner sex, it starts with me learning about myself, doing what I need to do to you know, heal myself, um, reframe negative messages that I've learned, heal, you know, heal shame, uh, heal trauma. So that's all that relationship with ourselves that we need to work on and the, the awareness of that. What's going on? What do we need to work on? Where are our challenges? Uh, what do we want to learn? 
then the next piece of it for partner skills is how do we manage our own wants, needs, and desires uh, and balance that out with our partner's wants, needs, and desires? How do we um, keep that awareness of ourselves? We were talking about the awareness piece. Um, yes, as yes. well as our awareness of our partner's wants and needs, and then the awareness of our of our relationship is it's really like a third entity: the I, the us, and the we. So that's a a framing that I like to use. And just say, to give one more piece of framing before we like dive down, I think that we um, there are a number of different categories of skills we need to have great relationships with ourselves and our partners. We need to learn not just communications, but we need to learn about boundaries and what healthy boundaries look like and how to play with and navigate those. And so there's lots of skills we can acquire in in different areas. And, um, and as yeah. we go on so with the program... Yeah. Today we're going to talk about boundaries more, and you, you call them beautiful boundaries, and I like that. So we'll talk a little bit more about boundaries as we go, because mm-hmm. that's essential. Yeah. Or maybe you want to talk about it now, but, uh, but I thought... Either way. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's, mean, let's, let's, let's follow your outline. You want to go. Okay. So partner awareness, we're talking about that now, you and um, I... Uh, have a a phrase that actually my husband Brian came up with, um, and I don't think it was original, but it's and I think we have talked about it before. But it's sync up um, that a skilled lover plugs into a woman's breath and her pelvic thrusts to follow her lead, and 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 also to listen to her vocalizations because there may be a pattern, and then the man can match her movements to that rhythm. Uh, For instance, rather than the old in and out, the man could try rotating his hips and make it a different kind of, making for a different kind of clitoral stimulation. And um, sometimes the absence of thrusting helps the man, changing it up helps the man last longer too, so it has that benefit. So sure. thinking up, I think, is important. I would, I would frame it awareness. that we want to sync up at, at all levels and with all the, the whole erotic encounter. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly with, with intercourse, that is kind of a, almost its own category, but that we, we want to get our trance states to be entrained with each other. Arousal is a, a trance. It's an altered state of consciousness. So mm-hmm. one of the awareness is I want to be aware of my own arousal trance and my own um, how I can enhance that. And I want to be aware of my partner's arousal trance and how I can enhance mm-hmm. that. And uh, so sort of first level skill is my own awareness. Second level skill is how do I balance that or alternate that with with uh, pleasuring my partner, being aware of their arousal level, and then how can we get to what I think of as sort of the highest level, which is that in syncness you're talking about, where our trances mm-hmm. become conjoined. We're in the yeah. same trance state, and at that point it becomes less relevant who's doing what to who, mm-hmm. um, because we have literally got our brain waves and our heart waves and our energy um, entrained so deeply that my turn on becomes your turn on when your turn on becomes my turn on and everybody's just going, um, going deep into that trance state. And there are a lot of skills we can actually use to do that besides this, uh, you know, awareness, those mental skills, but we can use our breathing we can use sound, and I would say it goes both ways. It's mm-hmm. you, super helpful for for uh, male-bodied people to to tune in to female-bodied people if that's who they partner with. But it doesn't even matter really what your plumbing is because the skill is how do we connect our erotic energy to that of another person. 
Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think there's um, uh, the part of the uh, conjoined trance or the trance is is a feeling of merging. And the, and the couple, some, some people are afraid of that because they don't have good boundaries. They have fears of merging and losing themselves. So I think the couple practicing this, they, they need to be fairly evolved and confident and know themselves well so that they don't have these fears come up. Well, I, yes, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, and I think that that actually touches sort of on that next set of skills, which are communication mm-hmm. skills. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that we become, we use our awareness for knowing where our boundary might be, and it might be uh, being able to communicate to a partner, these are activities I would like to do, these are activities I haven't ever done, but I might be willing to explore. Here are mm-hmm. some things that are just a hard no for me, at least right now in this encounter. And having that trust that you've communicated, your partner has received the communication, you're, uh, we're now moving into boundary skills a little bit, that you're going to, um, uh, that you're bound, you'll be safe, that your partner will respect mm-hmm. your boundaries and you'll be responsible for, for them. And, uh, and within that place of safety, we can totally relax, let down our guard, and that is how we can get into those trances that are really shared, um, and it is possible, I will say that I think it is possible when we are in a very new relationship that's really exciting, when we've fallen madly in love, mm-hmm. that we can get into that conjoined trance sometimes very easily and sometimes without having that deep knowledge or trust or communication about boundaries. We just kind of get swept away. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we want to learn how to get there more consciously and with more choice and when we don't have the I've fallen madly in love and in lust with you um, engine running things, that we can still mm-hmm. get there. In fact, we can get there more deeply um, in relationship where we've built the communication and the agreements and the understandings. So when we get there more deeply, it feels like really... Real intimacy, the word intimacy, into me you see. I mean, you, you feel that there's emotional and physical intimacy. Yeah, and I would even say spiritual, at least for some spiritual, people of course. relate yes. to that concept. But emotional, yeah. spiritual, energetic, yeah, I mean, I think it is the absolute um, deepest kind of intimacy we can get to when we literally get into these expanded ecstatic states with a partner. And uh, and also, but, you know, this is possible to create with somebody, whether it's a new relationship or an old relationship, we can do the things that will help us get to that place uh, or get farther, or deeper, or more into that place than perhaps we even knew it was possible to go to, which is sort of, you know, work. I'd like to try to, <laughs> like, how far can we go? How deep can how, we yeah, go? It, yes. How, and right? it, how, it, static how can far we can we go? Um, mm-hmm. And so part of that communication when you're, when you're with uh, your partner, um, and I, I like it that you say you could, you could even do that in the beginning of a relationship, but if you want to be able to keep it up, <laughs> you you need to mm-hmm. practice a little more consciously the skills that you're suggesting, and I th- that you are suggesting yes that you need to be fully transparent. Um, in and mm-hmm. yeah, a lot. Uh, I think I know from the couples counseling that I do. Um, if you want to have trust, you must be willing to share everything, and mm-hmm. and especially those things that you don't want to share. <laughs> Because I think it takes courage to fully love, to fully open your heart, and let your partner in um, when you don't know if he or she will like what she finds or he finds. Um, I think part of the courage is allowing the person to love you completely, your darkness as well as your 
light. So, so I say, drop the mask. If you, if you feel like you need to wear a mask around your partner, then and show up all perfect all the time, you'll never experience the full dimension of what love can be. I'm sure you yeah, agree. Because you're not going to be. If you're hiding part of yourself, your partner says, I love you, and inside you just go, yeah, well, if you really knew me, if you knew yeah. about those deep, ugly parts of me that I haven't shown you, then you wouldn't love me. And mm. once we have the courage, and courage is the word, once we have the courage to really show up fully, uh, including our wounds and our scars and the parts of us that we're not as thrilled with or proud of and our struggles, when we can really show up fully with all of that uh, and still be accepted and still be loved, then we can really receive love, fully receive love. Uh, yes, and that's such a good we, point. We can't. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then we can take it in because I think there's a part of it that if the person, usually this is unconscious, but if the person feels unworthy, then they're, mm-hmm. they're not as likely to be able to really receive real love. And, the, uh, and so then that sometimes takes uh, individual therapy work. To, to, if you come out of a family yeah. where there's, you know, where the mother was critical and alcoholic and the father the same. And it's just, so mm-hmm. a lot of messages that translate to the person as an adult to to being fearful and not feeling worthy and having trouble staying in the present and taking it all in um, and mm-hmm. enjoying the pleasure. That's the great opportunity and challenge of long-term relationships. Mm-hmm. Is we have mm-hmm. the opportunity to heal those things. Sometimes mm-hmm. it also includes one-on-one work with a good therapist mm-hmm. or, um, you know, different kinds of personal growth work of our own things. But we also have that opportunity with a partner to heal and grow and learn uh, and help each other. And I think that, again, that's one of the great gifts of long-term relationship, but you're absolutely right. It requires a deep commitment to being honest, to telling the truth, to being transparent, to saying what's hard. Ideally, Mm -hmm. we're going to learn how to do that in the best possible way. How can I say hard things in the kindest, most loving way Mm -hmm. um, so that my Mm -hmm. partner has the best chance of hearing it, right? So those are, and that's the communication skills that we need. And, uh, and then we have the opportunity to grow in amazing ways. And, and uh, another little piece of this probably has to do with the mirror neurons in our brains, that when we're with somebody a long time, we, we reflect back some of, the, some of them. And so we want to be with a person who can help us grow and, and vice versa, mm. the personal growth. Yeah. Don't you believe in mirror, mirror neurons? Oh, mirror neurons are why we can get into that conjoined trance, why mm. we can get to a point where if I'm doing something that pleasures my partner, it's turning me on because of yeah. mirror neurons. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of mirror neurons. And the, and <laughs> yay for mirror neurons. <laughs> um, yay for mirror neurons. Uh, and it's also, you know, why... Um, we have this capacity. I mean, I, I think I've got amazing capacity to give myself pleasure, but there are places I can get to with a partner mm-hmm. that I couldn't get to by myself. And I think because with myself, I'm not turning on the mirror neurons, right? I mean, that's, it's yeah. about me, and that's wonderful, and I can focus on me, and, and it can be fantastic. And at the same time, when um, with a partner and we really get to those expanded erotic states, there's this mm-hmm. other dimension that, uh, that is miraculous. That's the word that comes to mind, miraculous. I like that word. Yes. Mm-hmm. Miraculous. That's what it feels like, right? Yeah. Like it's miraculous. And it can take you to wonderland. I love the idea right. of wonderland. 
And those of us Beautiful. who have... And, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I was just going well, to say... Was gonna say we we're very lucky if we have a part... What? We, we all, all have, have the potential, potential yes. Yeah. We do. Yeah. And, and but it's, it's learnable. We can learn learnable. how to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And but you know, and, our culture tells us that we yes. should just fall madly in love and live happily ever after, and there's no work involved, and then, of course, that we don't live happily ever after unless we're working on it, you know, right. unless we're learning and growing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we have this cultural myth uh, that relationships somehow is going to be just this magical uh, experience that... Um, doesn't require any energy or effort. But it does. Live happily ever after. Yeah, that myth. <laughs> that that myth. <laughs> you know, it does help to be a more mature person with life experience. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I, I say that in the face of some of the physical ailments I've been having lately as a mature person. <laughs> but... Um, you know, it, it it also helps, of course, to stay positive and to have a partner who, who loves and supports you. So we're, we're very fortunate if we have that, and we want to cultivate it and keep it mm-hmm. and show show appreciation because um, I think um, when you speak up about appreciation, it creates good feelings, it draws us closer, and all of those things. Maybe this is segueing into more of the communication area. Um, well, well, what you're talking about now, I would call mm-hmm. positivity. And this is yeah. something that um, my partner and I have worked on a lot. Mm-hmm. As I will say, I, I did not come from an upbringing that where I was bathed in positivity. <laughs> you did not, yeah. And so you had a little more work to do. Yeah. Well, it's my my natural way of communicating was more critical and negative because that was my that was my environment, and you don't even know you're doing it until so your partner's going ow, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then you have to be willing to kind of go like oh, I don't want to be, I don't want to be like my mother. I don't want to be critical and judgmental and <laughs> yes, bitchy and you know, and then you have to really it's a lot of work to get down there and change these habits of communication and and um uh i'll just throw in a you know sometimes we we play what we call play bend games which are learning games and it can be something where you take you know five minutes or an hour or all day whatever it is you set a time and then you make the game and one of our games is a positivity game where we just try and slather the other person with positive appreciation. Usually we'll try and play it for a day. We totally forget, and then we have to remind each other. But, you know, for every (laughs) single thing that they do, they empty the dishwasher, and we're like, thank you so much. I just really appreciate that you've taken care of that. And, you know, know, they're leaving the room, and they say, well, I'll be back in a minute, and you're just like, well, well, thank you for letting me know that. That just really helps me, you know, plan what I'm going to do next, whatever. And uh-huh. uh, and to try and develop the skills of positivity. And, um, yeah, and like I said, for me, not easy. That's, that was always one of my, it's been one of my life challenges because of my upbringing. So, yeah, and, and so probably in terms of... Uh, well, I'm sorry, what? Just the last the thing opportunity, again. you know. The opportunity. The opportunity yeah. in relationship, yeah. Yeah. And if we think about ego states, so you've got the parent, the adult, and the child ego state, many people have a very well-developed critical parent ego state, and that's, from what I've read, that's the hardest one to get rid of, and some people will... Uh, take drugs or drink drink alcohol in order to put the um, critical parent to sleep so the child ego state, the child can come out to play. It's a really tough one. If you've had a parent modeling negativity and, criti- and being critical and being judgmental, 
it, it gets integrated into the into the child, and it's it's a it's a shame, and it interferes with good attachment. A lot of these folks have anxious attachment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it interferes with everything, and inter- because that negative, critical, judgmental voice that can go on. I it, I can lay that on myself as easily as I could lay it on a partner or a coworker or especially, you know, as as a boss as a, you know, I can lay that on an employee. And gosh, we don't I don't want to be doing that. That's not how I want to be interacting. So, it's uh in my intimate relationship where I'm going to have the most opportunity to see that, recognize it, and in a loving, self-healing way, start to reprogram that voice. And it's going to be as important for how I talk to myself. Right? Part of that journey has been recognizing how mean I can be to myself. <laughs> right? Yeah, and, um, and, and that, yeah. that is very destructive. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you, I get the image of the person banging their forehead against a wall, you know, and, mm-hmm. I don't deserve good stuff. I'm worthless, and so I'm going to be really mean to myself and sometimes sabotage a relationship in, in, the, in, the, in the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are all kinds of ways that relationship offers us healing, growing opportunities if mm-hmm. we look at it that way. If instead of sitting there going, God, my really, my partner is such a baby, you know, I mean, <laughs> he, gets, he gets so hurt so easily, uh, you know, or we can go, oh, I'm being hurtful. Hmm. Uh-huh. How could I be that would, how can I change that? And again, these are the learning, communication, relationship, and boundary skills that we we have the opportunity to heal in ourselves and with our partners. And, um, or, or not, I mean, if we, we don't have to heal it, but chances are we're not going to either have uh, the kind of partner we want or any partner, or we're not going to um, have the kind of friendships, um, work environment, I mean, you know, relations with our kids. I mean, this affects every relationship we have. So, again, uh, absolutely, and um, so, and good communication involves really speaking up. You know, some people believe if you really loved me, you should know. You should know what I want every moment, mm-hmm. and that's like going on a treasure hunt without any clues. Good communication is necessary, and I think it's even necessary in the light of day when you can see your partner's face and the su- subtle reactions. <laughs> You know, I think absolutely. I think yeah. that it it's um, it's certainly one of the keys mm-hmm. to a successful, happy relationship. And and I I think that there's lots of tools out there to help people. Um, I'll say uh, nonviolent communication (NVC), which is a a, a form of compassionate communication and that's based on empathy and understanding um, the stories that we create our, and understanding our feelings and our, our need systems. And it's a, a beautiful way of, of reprogramming yourself to communicate in a way that's positive and loving and it's useful in every relationship. Um, that work has been, I would say, the most significant thing that I've done that has really helped me not um, not have that critical, judgmental uh, voice uh, internally yes. and externally. Yeah. And is NVP nonviolent communication? NVC is that a nonviolent mm-hmm. NVC? Yeah. NVC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. C. There. Yeah. Nonviolent communication. Yeah. Is that a, actually a book? Or just a, uh, it started out as a book, yeah. Um, Marshall okay. Rosenberg wrote a book, and then it right. developed into programs. You can find workshops, and there's online things. And so it's. Um, uh, I found reading was useful for me. The 
I did various workshops over the years. The thing that was the most uh, deep and foundationally um, um, healing and, and changing was uh, doing some intensives. We, my partner and I, did several week-long intensives, and that was uh, such a gift. So much awareness and skill building and um, realizations about, um, you know, for example, the stories we tell ourselves and then we, mm. uh, that we trigger ourselves. That's a good one. So trigger. instead of going, oh, my partner triggered me, my partner did something that hurt me mm-hmm. um, and I'm mad at them. Instead, it's uh, possible for us now to go like, oh, this is what happened, objective reality, and then I triggered myself. Mm-hmm. And I did that, and, and then being empathetic with yourself. I, I understand why I did that. This is what I'm feeling. My feelings are valid. These were the needs that were underneath, and here's what I can do about it. It's really, really powerful stuff. So We have um, in this the, area, yeah. John and Julie Gottman uh, do intense mm-hmm. with couples. They do long mm-hmm. weekends, too. Um, mm-hmm. And I've had... I've, well, actually, Brian and I were were comped about four years ago to attend a weekend session, and uh, and, and that was very nice of them because I, I really think their work is just wonderful in 40 years of research and so on. Um, mm-hmm. But then he... Books, and I think they're wonderful. Yeah. He's... Uh, yeah. The way that John Gottman can predict divorce is amazing. You know, he has a master's hmm. in finance in mathematics from MIT, in addition to all of his psychological, he's a psychologist, but he has, so he can, has this formula where, and you probably are familiar with it, but um, where if you say something negative or do something mm. really negative, then you have to replace it with about four positives. And he, right. taped, he taped his couples over a period of many, many years, um, in the in the so called love lab, and they were videotaped. They were hooked up um, with monitors to see about their blood. They, their urine was examined, so that when they were in conflict, he could see the physiological changes. And so this is mm. pretty in depth work. Um, mm-hmm. And I've had a number of clients who have really benefited from a long weekend or or even a, a longer time than that. So the intensive, yeah. um, you can go deeper, don't you think, with, with the intensive? Yeah, and, you know, there, there are some wonderful relationship teachers out there whose work is profound. I mean, the, mm-hmm. uh, the Gottmans, I think, the uh, Harville Hendricks work about the imago, you know, about mm-hmm. why we're attracted to our partners and where that, the potential for healing um, is fantastic. And um, and the MVC stuff. These are all amazing tools for helping us understand ourselves, helping us understand our partners, helping us understand why we're attracted to who we're attracted to, and uh, because we're going to we're going to get into the stuff with somebody if we're in significant relationship. It's going to come up. We're it's not we're not going to live happily ever after uh, unless we. Develop skills this is where the whole thing we're talking about, which are relation skills, and and I I would have to say that most of the stuff I I've, I've learned and and worked with and practiced over all these years has really come from these many different people who um, have such wisdom. Uh, but got to do the work. Got to be willing to. Got to do the work. Do the work. And, and yeah, back in yeah. Well, 2013, um, there was an article by Harville Hendricks and his mm-hmm. wife, Helen Hunt. Mm-hmm. You familiar with her name? Mm-hmm. So yes, she, um, she's they partnered they, with him in most of his work. Yes, yeah. yes. So they were they were married for 30 years, but then 15 years ago, they're saying in the at, at 20. 13, they were on the verge of filing a divorce. Here, they're two therapists, but, you know, we're, we're all um, vulnerable, right? 
Um, mm-hmm. So a, fa- a fellow marriage counselor told them that they were the worst couple he'd ever encountered. <laughs> he called them the <laughs> couple from hell. Imagine. <laughs> right. And um, so, uh, so th- they resolved to remove negativity from their own relationship and to eliminate mm-hmm. negativity patterns. And mm-hmm. so they, um, couples can change their patterns and, and turn their relationships into safe places where negativity is replaced by pleasure and, and maybe even a more lightened, lighthearted communication. So what they did was to resolve, they had a contract with each other, mm-hmm. with your partner to go 30 days without negativity in the relationship. That's hard. I've suggested this to some of my clients. <laughs> That's hard, mm-hmm. but it can be transforming if you do it. And um, yeah, and, and you I already think, yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, and I, I, I got a lot of that positivity stuff from them having done uh, workshops with them more recently uh, after having done work with them 15 years, you know, 20 years ago, and then um, uh, going around again and doing work with them whenever in the last, after they revised their work to include that positivity piece. And uh, that was, uh, um, has, has been very, very useful for us. Like I said, I think wow. I um, um, really had um, not just a, a negativity, but the a framework that it was okay to be negative. Um, well, that's so what you not probably only was witnessed growing up. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So their work, when they, you know, shifted it and started saying what you really need to do, all this positivity, it was going, oh, I do. Mm-hmm. I really do. Shit. <laughs> They also suggest, oh, yeah, yeah. and this fits yeah. in here, they also suggest re- replacing judgment with curiosity. So oh, that, that's, yeah, that's beautiful. Rather than become negative when your partner says or does something you disagree with, become curious. Well, why did he say or do this thing? Or why did mm-hmm. she do this? Why did she feel this way? And, um mm-hmm. In my experience, usually the partner is not intending to frustrate you. He's just Mm -hmm. being himself. So being curious rather than judgmental about behavior often uh, offers the opportunity. You use the word opportunity, and so do I, to Mm. opportunity to to know your partner better and yourself in the process. Mm -hmm. That's the nice thing about committed long-term relationships. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, and then you have the co-learning opportunity. Then you can go, hmm, and 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 again, this is I'm doing this in kind of an NVC way, but to be able to go, hmm, I noticed this happened, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm curious. I'm wondering, you know, what was going on in you or for you. Um, I mean, you can ask yourself what you think might have been going on for them. Mm-hmm. Then you're just going to still be in your stories. Um, but to be able to ask your partner, not in any kind of a like, what the heck is wrong with you way, but more of a like, I'm really curious that, you know, when that happened, what was going on for you? What were you thinking? What were you feeling? And your partner can say, well, you know, I was actually feeling anxious about something or I was, um, I was a little angry about something, you know, and then you've got a, the real thing to talk about and communicate with. And you can even, you can say something like, uh, when that happens, it would work better for me if you framed it this way. You know, it's it's just ongoing learning opportunities. That's how I I see relationship and um, and uh, developing our skills, all of those skills. How to how to give and receive positivity. How to be honest. How to practice courage. Um, and and how to it, say hard things. In kind ways, which that's a very important a one. All, one all that you said is yeah. important, but this is really how to say hard things in kind ways. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 
because I think for me, I'm a very forthright person. So I would just say something, um, and my partner might be devastated by it. And I'm like, well, I'm being honest. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's the only important thing. But I wasn't thinking about, is this a good time? What's a gentle way to say it? What's an understanding way to say it? Um, what kind of response or reaction might I get? And can I frame it in such a way that that will mitigate it or make it easier to hear? And, you know, even for things like saying no, because boundaries are, we didn't really talk too much about, but, uh, you know, if my partner asked me something and I am clear that the answer is no, it used to be I would just be like, no, no. And mm-hmm. he would hate that. I mean, it just he did not respond well to hearing that. But mm-hmm. now I know that I can say, well, sweetie, I get why you would want that. I totally understand you wanting that. And I even wish I could give that to you. It's not going to work for me right now. But is there something else that I could do now that would uh, meet that need? Or is there some other way we can meet the need? Or um, maybe we can do something like, you know, now we have a conversation about it. And I haven't said no. I'm still telling the truth, but I'm saying it in a gentle way, and I'm saying it with a, a framing of, of love and connection, and that's a whole different ballgame. He can hear that, no problem. And then we can work towards the, what's, what, a, what could be a yes. What could I say yes to? Um, and I, I like that a lot. And interwoven with all, the, all of that is the curiosity piece, the, replacing the yeah. judgment with curiosity that... Um, you know, I think ultimately we need to see our partners for themselves and with their own private world of personal meaning, with their own ideas and dreams, and, and they're, not, they're not an extension of ourselves. Uh, well, sometimes I think there's some magical thinking, oh, you know, that we're joined at the hip, we all two hearts that. beating as one we and all of that. everybody is just like us. We think everybody yeah. is just like us, and then when they're not, we're so annoyed at them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Why aren't you doing what I would do? Why aren't you saying what I would say? <laughs> they never do. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, we can, I, I'll give an example. Um, so somebody might, before they have this awareness, they might say, you liked that awful movie? Instead of saying it that mm-hmm. way, tell me what you liked about that movie. I want to know what you think. So, because mm-hmm. genuine curiosity is very sexy, it it leads to vulnerable sharing and deepens connection. Yes, and another one of those factors that predicts relationship uh, success in the sense of, of being happy together is interest, being genuinely interested in the other person. Oh, yes. And you'll see that. Yes. You know, like if you're, if you're at a restaurant, you look around at couples, You'll see a couple where they seem really interested in each other, and usually that means that they're new. <laughs> yeah. You'll see some couple that have been together forever, and they're just so bored. They're just not even looking at each other or communicating or something. Uh, there's nothing going on between them. They just don't seem interested. And, in fact, it's one of the things that often um, uh, draws people to have affairs. Is yes. There's this new yes. person, and they're so interested in me. Uh-huh. And we long for that, right? So that being interested, it's it's another important building block of of long term relationship. What did not just you know what you do today, you know, but you know what happened today? What would what was great? What didn't work for you? What was making you sad? Uh, what upset you? What did you learn? Um, yeah, that's part of what keeps relationships juicy. Being genuinely interested and every misunderstanding or confusion or breakdown or upset is an opportunity for that curiosity so again an opportunity for that curiosity uh, yeah we mm-hmm. we need to it, 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 being interested in each other it's also very um uh it's very positive in that you if you feel like your partner is really interested in you then you're more likely to feel close to them. They, you know that you, I want to know all that I can know about about you, and I and I never want to stop growing together. 
um, you know, that, that stagnant pond breeds malaria. And the flowing stream is always fresh and cool. Uh, so mm-hmm. atrophy is the natural process when, when you, oh, I'm experiencing this a little bit because I, I, I am having some leg muscle problems. And, um, mm. and so, it, yeah, when you stop working the muscle, it's just as if you stop working your relationship. So I think it's important to mm-hmm. never stop growing together and having that awareness which mm-hmm. you and I both are giving some good suggestions for people that really want to grow in this area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in the time that we have left, which isn't much, did you want to just yeah. get, you've already given an overview of uh, boundaries um, because we've mm-hmm. talked about self-awareness, know yourself and how that will help, and authentic communication, say what you really mean, Um Is there more that you'd like to say about maybe the sacred boundaries? Because in the past you've talked about sacred boundaries. That's that spiritual piece. Well, in the minute or two. (laughs) Yeah, and we do have to stop about two or three minutes before the top of the hour. But I know, I know. Maybe we can carry this over. Every time it happens. (laughs) I take back. I take that back. Why don't you say? What kind of an overview as you see it from the from this program, and and then of course you know I always do the write up and and tell people to go well listen to the archived version which should be up by tomorrow morning. Um, but is it, so, do you want to just do kind of the take takeaways that you'd like the listeners yeah. to to yeah good. Yeah, well, I think it it starts with sweeping out those myths that we've been given about our partners are psychic. If they loved us, they would know um, uh, that we're just going to live happily ever after without any work. And look at the journey of relationship as being uh, full of challenges that could be opportunities for learning and growing together. And that there are wonderful teachers and tools out there and avail yourselves of them. Um, things like, you know, Imago Therapy for the Hendricks, the Gottman's work, the, the um, uh, nonviolent communication. There's just fantastic tools out there that can help us just be better, happier human beings for, with all our relationships and, and mm-hmm. connections, not just our intimate partners, and uh, help us be happier, healthier people. And uh, Relationship does, I think, offer an amazing, amazing set of opportunities. So we, just have to, we have to reframe and look at that that way instead of going, oh, this person is driving me crazy, and go, hmm, here's an interesting opportunity. <laughs> opportunity. You learn, use the word a lot, and I like it. Thank yeah. you, Sherry, for another great program. Thank you, Diana. And we'll have mm-hmm. we'll, the next time you're on, which will be soon, we'll talk about the, your anatomy book. So bye, everybody. Awesome. Thank you. E se ti perderai nel labirinto di un amaro autore, ma i tuoi piedi cadono.